It's, it's the, the solutions people find to problems. Uh, why is it that uh, on an Indonesian island, a fisherman has a round boat, like a basket? If you go to Wales, uh, you will find coracles, which are virtually the same thing. Strange. <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, um, same problems, same physical situations produce very similar um, results. Not always. Um, and it's fascinating this way in which different types of boat have evolved to, how can I put it, to answer question, uh, answer problems. Why is the Thames barge flat? Why? Because when he's up against the quay on the Thames, and the tide goes out, he's sitting on the mud. If he has a keel, no good. Um, why uh, a ship of such a size as a Thames barge can be handled by two men? It's like the boats here. The boats here, the, the, the barquette is, the barquette Marseillaise is the Italian. Why? Because the Italians came here uh, to escape poverty and they came here and built boats and so the Marseille boats are largely uh, Italian but the rigging of a bet uh, with its Latin sail or the barquette with a Latin sail its origins lie um, the other side of the Mediterranean they're Arab a conception the conception of the Latin sail, the development of it, was largely Arab. So much so that the uh, the Shebek of Morocco would attack the square-rigged vessels of Europe coming through the Straits of Gibraltar heading for Venice or Alexandria or, or wherever, Barcelona. Uh, they would be attacked by the, uh, by the Shebek Arab boats, which could climb up against the wind. The square riggers couldn't. My name is John Pendre. I was born uh, in uh, Pinna in Middlesex, in, next to London. Uh, I'm a marine painter. I lived in now uh, in Marseille for the last uh, 40, 42 years. Uh, and I am French. I've taken French nationality and retained my British nationality. I was sent with my mother and my sister to um, Cornwall, to the little port of St. Ives, where my father grew up, to uh, get away from the bombing of London by, by the Germans. A uh, very rather frightening experience. And um, <coughs> while we were there, my sister and I discovered the Cornish beaches, the Cornish Sea, and we realised there was something more there than in the suburbs of London. Uh, that I was hooked for the sea forever. I bought my first boat at 16. I worked in a factory grinding oil colour for Windsor and Newton and with the money I bought a rather rotten sailing dinghy and I've always had a boat since then. Yeah, I've been obsessed with, with boats. I wrote my thesis at art school on the rigging of ships. Uh, at art school, um, your thesis, the subject, was of no importance. What was important was the thesis itself as an object. I went to the Science Museum at London and studied the, the uh, traditional boats of the coasts of England and uh, I became aware that they're all different. There's massive different boats now around the Mediterranean, all the way around you have different types of boats. The type of craft you'll see in Malta, beautiful craft in Malta, probably the most beautiful. Um, the Greek boats with their broad shoulders and the sort of nose in the air. Magnificent. Well, here Marseille is Greek. 
I mean, our city is Greek. Marseille, uh, Massalia, uh, salt town. That's what it means fundamentally, I believe. It basically means the place of the salt. And we still produce salt at San Luis, just down the coast. Uh, and so here it's Greek. I mean, when we go to Greece, my wife and I, and the Greeks say, oh, where are you from? And we say, uh, Massalia. They smack us on the back and they say, bravo. <laughs> Because it is Greek. At the entrance of the harbour, there are blocks of Greek marble. And uh, of course, uh, if you, I don't know if you noticed, at the, old, um, the end of the old harbour, near just beside the Canabier, you can see the old Greek walls of the city. And if you look, the Romans pour it all down. The Greeks, coming from what is now Turkey, which was originally Greece, uh, don't say that to the Turks, um, were working their way along the coast, the north coast of the Mediterranean, looking for trading posts. They wanted to do commerce. Um, and they worked their way along the south coast of France, but there are a lot of hills and mountains, particularly when you come to Cassie and that, it's a very awkward place. And then uh, they came along past the Calanque of Marseille. Which, I mean, there you've got some of the highest cliffs in Europe. And they came round a corner, and there was a bay with a couple of two or three islands in the middle. And they probably experienced the Mistral. They probably knew the main wind was coming from the northwest, and it was nasty. And as they worked their way along, they came to two rock outcrops, and between them a space, and they went through the space. <laughs> and there was the old harbour of Marseille. Well, it wasn't the old harbour of Marseille because Marseille didn't exist. But there were people there, and there was this beautiful sheltered port, or potential port, with freshwater spring at the head of it, soft ground for landing their, their uh, rather delicate ships, and there were people. And so they started to trade. Um, and the people, apparently, if I've understood it, but I'm no expert, uh, had salt. So the Greeks thought, oh, this is interesting, salt's worthwhile. Uh, they no doubt had things they wanted to sell to the people who were there. And the legend is that um, the daughter, I don't know if you know this legend, the daughter of the local chieftain or princeling or whatever, uh, had to choose her fiancé. And um, she, uh, the, the tradition was it was the girl who chose the man by offering him a goblet of wine. <laughs> The girl was no fool <laughs> because she looked at the local talent and then she saw the, um, the very bronzed, strong, muscled Greek captain. She offered him the go <laughs> goblet of wine. And so there was a marriage between the Greeks and, and, the, and the local inhabitants. I travel, uh, I go on missions with the French Navy. So I've been on all sorts of crafts, from minesweepers through to the uh, Charles de Gaulle, the nuclear aircraft carrier, which is too big, small by American standards. But um, uh, I've been on frigates, I've been on Moroccan frigates, been all sorts of things. And when you see the complexity of uh, an anti-aerian frigate and all the stuff that's in it, and it's, you know, uh, every single nut and bolt as a particular purpose, every single thing. So you spend your time trying to understand how the ship works. Once you understand how it works, you can then paint it. But the, the complexity of, of, of ships is incredible, but everything has a purpose. And quite often the beauty of a traditional boat is that it's reduced down to its simplest possible form. If one cable can do two jobs, then it'll be just one cable. When a boat builder dies, that 
if he hasn't got apprentices, it goes with him. Probably the most remarkable boat I've seen is a, a boat in India on a beach in Kerala, which was made out of four trunks of palm tree. Very heavy. I mean, you couldn't lift it. It was only a few meters long. Uh, just big enough for a man to sit on and to paddle with a split bamboo. Now, why on earth are they building a boat like that? Well, the reason was simple, that on the beach, they were breaking waves. A light construction boat would be smashed trying to go through the waves, but this heavy boat, made of three planks strapped together at the bow and the stern, could punch its way through the wave and man could get out to sea. He'd stay out at sea all night, seven kilometers out apparently, with a little lamp and he'd fish all night and then come back in. But the boat is too heavy to lift. So what do you do? Well, you undo the lacing at the front and the lacing at the stern, and with a mate, you lift the three planks up to the top of the beach. And at the top of the beach, you see all the planks lined up. And when they want to go back out to sea, they lift the three planks down, strap them together, off they go. But uh, it, it, as I say, it's, it's interesting to see that the stitching on the Roman boat, which we've got in the museum here, is exactly the same stitching as the, the, the boat I, I, I spent an afternoon on in Kerala in India. Same stitching. Same, same size, everything. It's, it's identical. The Vikings stitch their boats, I believe. And in the Shetland Islands, I have a vague memory that certain boats of the Shetlands also had the keel stitched to the hull. Why not? And that's another thing which gets lost. When a traditional boat gets lost, the skills get lost. How you handle them. I knew you.